teen years. For most girls, a time of high hopes and young dreams. But not for every girl. They had taken Linda, wrapped her up in a knife, and they put her into the Subaru. Rebellious acts. Toxic romances. The end result? Lives in ruin. Now you're off the mind, and I'm guaranteeing you I'm no murder you. You had like the American dream and the American nightmare meeting each other on the highway. With rare footage and exclusive interviews from behind bars, we'll reveal shocking stories of teenagers convicted of unthinkable crimes. Really, you could end up here. I want to go home. I really want to go home. When Girls Kill, next. In many ways, these two Florida teenagers had a lot in common. They were from the same neighborhood, and both had everything to live for. Rachel Wade was sort of an all-American girl. Sarah was a good kid. She had the whole world ahead of her. But 19-year-old Rachel Wade and 18-year-old Sarah Ludman wanted the same boy, and their love triangle spiraled out of control. Now you're off of mind, and I'm guaranteeing you I'm no f***ing murder you. I'm letting you know that now. In an exclusive interview, Rachel Wade relives the shocking outcome. I wish we could go back and instead of going against each other, maybe sitting down and talking through and just understanding that we didn't need him. Rachel Wade grew up an average kid from a stable family. Rachel was actually a fun, loving child, very happy-go-lucky. I was very active in school, did whatever I could, whatever clubs I could join. Like a lot of little girls, Rachel rebelled when she hit her teens. As soon as I got to about 15 or so, I started kind of veering off in the wrong direction. Rachel dropped out of school, ignored her curfew, and fought with her parents. Boys became her biggest interest, and she was chasing different boys. I don't think they were always the best boys to be with. We went through some tough times with her. But as she turned 18, Rachel earned her GED and landed a job as a waitress. She moved out of her parents' home and began to find herself. And I kind of went on my own path. Rachel was fun, loud, girly, you know, sassy. She was a very independent woman, very strong-willed, kind of took the bull by the horns and took control of her own life. In the summer of 2008, Rachel ran into a boy she had known since childhood. 19-year-old Josh Camacho was not a grade school kid anymore. He was a player. He definitely had this bad boy image. He was all tatted up. He had pictures of himself, you know, with guns and pit bulls and smoking weed and just had this whole rap star persona. He wasn't what he was portraying himself to be. I just saw a whole nother side of him when we were alone. It was really good at first. About a month or two after we started dating, I started getting phone calls. According to Rachel, the angry calls came from 18-year-old Sarah Ludman, who started dating Josh around the same time. This was her first boyfriend, her first true love, and she went into it with innocent eyes. In court records, Josh characterized his relationship with both Sarah and Rachel as friends with benefits. But by the summer of 2008, the rivalry between the two girls was heating up. She decided that she was going to come to my job, made me spill some drinks. They followed me and my roommate home and tried to run us off the road. And it kind of just kept getting worse after that night. According to court documents, Rachel retaliated with threatening texts and insulting messages on social media sites and voicemails with explicit, often frightening warnings. Seriously, I told you to watch back and not kill him. Now you're out of mind, and I'm guaranteeing you I'm no murder you. I'm letting you know that now, because you know what? Josh might have played me, but then I'm a player ass out too. Walk. It just got really acrimonious. Sarah was so upset by those messages. That's, you know, what both of the girls had in their heads. Well, Josh wasn't the problem. It was the other girl. Court papers state by April 14th, 2009, the situation hit the boiling point. That morning at school, Sarah had been crying to her friends, and she was completely despondent to the point that her friends were like, you need to break up with him. You need to dump that guy. Later that evening, Rachel claimed Sarah showed up at her apartment. I heard her outside beeping her horn to let me know that she was out there. I was home alone, so I wanted to leave. On her way to the door, Rachel made a fateful decision. When I went to walk out of my house, I grabbed the knife off the kitchen counter. 
she made a tragic mistake of picking up a steak knife, just a usual kitchen steak knife, and she put it in her purse for protection. Rachel decided to go to a friend's house. Sarah met up with Josh. They were watching movies and hanging out at his sister's house, but he kept texting with Rachel. Josh later told police that he actually was telling Rachel to go back to her own house. Meanwhile, it was getting late and Sarah was out past her curfew. Sarah was supposed to be home at 11 o'clock. She was getting ready to go home. Sarah got into her van and planned to drop off Josh's sister and another girl at a local restaurant on her way home. As they drove, Sarah was flagged down by a car going in the opposite direction. The driver was a friend of Sarah's. He said, oh my gosh, you know, Rachel is right up the street. In a matter of minutes, things started to explode. Sarah raced up the street. According to court documents, Rachel was sitting on the hood of her car smoking a cigarette when Sarah's van suddenly appeared. She pulled up about five feet in front of my car. What they didn't know is that Rachel had a knife. Coming up, you won't believe how this feud came to a bloody end. I grabbed the knife and she approached me anyways. At 12.45 a.m. on April 15, 2009, after months of feuding over the same boy, it was finally showdown time between 19-year-old Rachel Wade and 18-year-old Sarah Ludman. They wanted to confront each other. According to police reports, Rachel sat on the hood of her car as Sarah drove toward her. There were two other girls in Sarah's van, including the sister of Josh Camacho, the boy at the center of the triangle. According to court records, Sarah came to a stop just a few feet from her rival. I grabbed the knife, thinking it might scare her off, and she approached me anyways. In court documents, witnesses disagree about who started the fight, but everyone recalls it was over quickly. They fought in the middle of the street for no more than five seconds. It was pulling hair. Next thing you know, it stops. She hit me three or four times. I started swinging back. And the next thing I remember, she let go of me and turned around and walked back to her van. Sarah yelled out to her friends. Sarah was screaming for them to get back in the car so they could leave. I just saw blood on the knife. I didn't physically remember stabbing her. I didn't see where she was stabbed. Sarah managed to get to the van and grab her phone. Police reports state that she called Josh Camacho. She said it hurts. At that point, the, the line fell. She lost consciousness. She ended up lying in the middle of the road. Shocked witnesses dialed 911. Rachel! Get out of her. Okay, where on the body is the patient? Yeah. In the chest. She's trying to breathe. According to police records, Rachel retreated with the knife in her hand. She walked up the driveway and ultimately threw the knife uh, up onto the neighboring residence's roof. Rachel sat on the porch of a nearby home as police and EMTs arrived. They quickly determined Sarah was stabbed twice in the chest. She had a small injury here, a stab wound here. She was stabbed right in the heart. Um, it pierced her heart. During the frantic effort to save Sarah's life, Josh Camacho received a call from his sister at the scene. Josh hurried to get there and arrived before Sarah was taken away in an ambulance. But at the hospital, she could not be saved. Sarah was pronounced dead at 2.29 AM. Detective Mike Lynch was gathering evidence when he learned the case was now a homicide investigation. I ended up finding Rachel sitting in an, what used to be a bench uh, located in front of the residence. Her demeanor was calm. I was scared, but at the same time, I didn't really know what to think or how to react. Rachel claims she was not aware Sarah was dead when she agreed to be questioned at police headquarters. I wasn't under arrest or anything, so again, I was thinking, you know, maybe it's not that bad. I was down at the hospital, and I saw where she was stabbed at. She made no indication that there had been a stabbing, that there was a knife involved. The detective told Rachel exactly what happened. The next piece of information that you need to know is that she is dead. <laughs> oh, my God. And she died as a result of these stab wounds. When they told me that she had passed away at the hospital, I kind of lost it. I couldn't believe what they were telling me. The hard truth of her situation became clear when Rachel was charged with second degree murder. Bail was set at $500,000. If convicted, the 19 year old faced life in prison. Fact is she stabbed her and she killed her. For second degree murder, I didn't have to prove she intended to murder her. 
Sarah and came looking for a fight. So it was apparent to me that this was a good self-defense case. Murder or self-defense. The lines were drawn when the trial began in July 2010. Among the witnesses called by the prosecution, Josh Camacho. His tough bad boy pose was gone. Josh coolly maintained that he had an open relationship with both girls. When he came into court, the appearance was just a little guy, very quiet, very soft-spoken. He says, uh, I wasn't dating either girl. They're not my girlfriends. After these girls and their friends and their families talked about how he was their whole world and said, eh, I was just sleeping with them. Camacho's testimony was shocking. But the prosecution's most damaging evidence came from Rachel herself, the threatening voicemails Sarah had saved. I'm going to find you, and I'm going to beat your ass. He can get anything he wants from me. You still got your mommy and daddy's curfew, bitch. Why do you run your mouth, and why are you that pathetic? So keep talking, Sarah. I'm going to teach you it. I'm telling you now. I couldn't believe that it was me. It just, it was out of character for me to say anything like I said to her. Please tell me, Sarah, why you would be a dumb enough put a brand new picture of you and Josh at the beach on your MySpace. I'm no murder you. I'm gonna play your ass out too. Watch. You're a fat bitch and I'm gonna kill you. If you're a prosecutor, you don't get a whole lot better evidence than that. In a risky defense move, Rachel took the witness stand and claimed she received similar messages from Sarah. It's a shame that uh, Rachel didn't save voicemails from Sarah with threats, but she didn't. The jury deliberated less than three hours we, the jury, find as follows, ask that the defendant in this case, the defendant is guilty of murder in the second degree as charged. So say we all, Michael Schwartz, four person of jury, July 23, 2010. In September, Rachel was back in court for sentencing, and the stakes were high. She could receive life in prison, or get credit for time served as a youthful offender and go free. Sarah's mother, Gay Ludman, wanted the maximum this is my daughter. She lays in a cemetery. I go visit her there. The judge sentenced Rachel to serve 27 years behind bars. It's a tragedy for both sides. That's all I got to say. Justice has been served. We've lost our daughter as far as having her home with us, but she's still here for us, fortunately, to visit and look forward to someday her coming home. Uh, but Sarah's lost, you know. Her parents have lost their only daughter. Both parents, I mean, they, they felt like they did everything they could to be good parents. They'd raised girls that they were proud of. Still, Rachel does have remorse. Not sitting down to talk to Sarah would be my biggest regret. We should have met up and we should have talked. And maybe it should have been him that we confronted. And instead of going after him, maybe walking away from him, no matter what somebody says about you or to you, it's not going to resolve anything to go out and fight him. And really, you could end up here. Up next, this Kentucky teen called herself the devil's daughter and unleashed hell with her group of young followers. I sought out people that had been ostracized. Mm -hmm. April 1997, springtime in rural Tennessee. Vidar Lilylid, his wife Delphina, and their two young children were returning home from a religious convention. They decided to go get, have a picnic with the kids and stop at the Bayleton Rest Exit. This ordinary detour would lead to a violent and horrifying crime. This one was certainly the most tragic thing I've witnessed. Surprisingly, most of the suspects were just teenagers. Their alleged ringleader was a charismatic 18-year-old girl who seemed fascinated with satanic rituals. They were into self-mutilation. They would cut themselves and they would drink each other's blood. Most of their guidance came from Natasha. Natasha Wallen was born in January of 1979 in a poor section of Eastern Kentucky's coal mining country. Natasha had what you would have to call a really troubled childhood. Her mother had a history of troubled relationships. When Natasha was just five years old, she made an upsetting discovery. She had a stepfather, and she thought that was her real dad, and she found out that another man in the town was her real dad. 
shock to her. I felt betrayed. And once you're betrayed, you've always got that um, wondering if somebody's going to betray you again. Dr. Helen Smith, a forensic psychologist and filmmaker, interviewed both Natasha and her mother, Madonna Wallen, for her documentary, Six. Natasha, she grew up, got aggressive towards uh, her mother. Her mother also had uh, emotional problems, as well as Natasha. According to court documents, the feuding escalated when Natasha was 14. She was arrested for assaulting her mother and threatening her with a knife. Soon after her mother agreed to dismiss the charges, Natasha attempted suicide by slashing her wrists. She was hospitalized at a Kentucky psychiatric facility. They told me that, said that she needed to stay longer. She was still a troubled child, but you know, I can afford to keep her in the hospital. They paid for 11 days and that was it. Court records state that Natasha was diagnosed as manic depressive and bipolar. She was prescribed Haldol, an antipsychotic drug, but she didn't take her medication. Load them up with pills. That's the answer to everything. Medicate. Court documents state that she did use illegal drugs, like cocaine and heroin. Natasha developed a dark fantasy life. According to police, the teenager often signed her name backward as Ah Satan and she attracted other teenage outcasts. I sought out people that had been ostracized, you know, for one reason or another, from the same people that were condemning me. In her mid-teens, Natasha found love. She was married to a guy named Stephen Cornett, and they got married on her 17th birthday. They had this very sort of elaborate Gothic wedding where everybody was dressed in black. But after a few months, the marriage ended abruptly. But she did keep his last name. Alone, Natasha spent more time with her friends, which included 20-year-old Joe Reisner, 19-year-old Dean Mullins, Crystal Sturgill, who was 18, 17-year-old Karen Howell, and 14-year-old Jason Bryant. According to the Chicago Tribune, on Friday, April 4th, 1997, the group rented a room at a motel in Pikeville, Kentucky, but this was no typical high school party. It was a satanic ritual type situation. There was cutting, there was um, drinking blood. It was just like some, something crazy. I don't know, maybe a way of bonding. A story in the Knoxville News Sentinel reported that two days later, Natasha and friends piled into a small hatchback. They headed south toward New Orleans, armed with a 9mm Smith & Wesson handgun and a 25 caliber semi-automatic pistol. On the afternoon of April 6th, Vidar and Delphina Lillilid and their two kids were driving back home to Knoxville after attending a Jehovah's Witness conference in Johnson City. The Lillilid family stopped at this rest area uh, to use the bathroom and to have a little picnic, let the kids run around a little bit. A little while later, a hatchback pulled in and six goth teens climbed out. You had like the American dream and the American nightmare meeting each other on the highway. Vidar, who was still probably pumped up from the convention, he thought, well, I'll talk to them about God. According to court testimony, the religious conversation suddenly turned into a carjacking. Joe Reisner is the one who pulled the gun on them. Told them they weren't going to hurt anybody. That's what they told them. So we just want your van. Court documents state Vidar and his family were loaded into their van at gunpoint. Natasha and three of her friends got in with them, while two others followed in the hatchback. They drove them to the next exit. They pulled into the first sort of small rural road they found. The area appears to be more remote than it actually is. What occurred in the woods that night was a tragic clash of innocence and evil. The witnesses heard the gunshots. Coming up, the horrifying fate of a helpless family. How could a teenager commit such a cold-hearted crime? I could have made different choices, and I should have made different choices.
About 8.30 on the night of April 6, 1997, Natasha Cornett and her group of teen outcasts were speeding through Tennessee in a stolen van. Just a few miles away, sheriffs in Greene County responded to a reported disturbance. I received a call of a party going on up here. Might be some shooting. We've seen a little blue car setting up the road here. The tiny hatchback was empty. I looked out my window, and I seen four bodies laying over here. The mother and father were dead. They were laying here. And the little girl was sitting over here. And the little boy was here, kind of in the ditch, laying on his mama's lap. Vidar and Delfina Lilylid lay in a ditch, both dead from gunshots. Their children, six-year-old Tabitha and two-year-old Peter, were critically wounded, but still breathing. EMTs rushed the children to a local hospital. Officials examined the blood-soaked crime scene. The two adults, they had two wounds in common, bullet holes that formed perfect triangles. Somebody must have intentionally wanted to make a triangle, and they succeeded. The odd chest wounds were not the only gruesome injuries. The father was shot in the left eye. The mother also had three other bullet wounds. The next day, Tabitha died in the hospital. Two-year-old Peter still clung to life with gunshot wounds to his chest and right eye. Although the suspects stripped the license plates and contents from the hatchback at the crime scene, they overlooked one clue that led detectives to Kentucky. They left a receipt from Pikeville, and that receipt let the police pretty quickly identify the car, and then they knew who they were looking for. Police launched a nationwide manhunt while Natasha and her friends headed south in the Lily Lids van. They felt like they needed to get out of the country. I mean, they, they had just murdered people. Two days after the shootings, Natasha and the five other young fugitives arrived at the Mexican border near Douglas, Arizona. They were allowed to cross. They had made their way safely into Mexico. According to court testimony, some time after entering the country, the teens encountered Mexican police. After finding a knife in the van, officers ordered the group back to the border. There was an all-points bulletin out for them. But the computers hadn't worked all day. As they approached the border crossing, the system came back online. They had the bad luck being the first car to come through that border crossing station there when the computer came back up. And they were all arrested on the spot. Police reports state the suspects had in their possession social security cards and other property belonging to the murder victims. They also had two handguns. We, of course, went to Arizona and followed up on all that and found the guns. And they were ballistically matched to the shell casings recovered at the scene and bullets recovered from the bodies. Natasha and the rest of the group were transported back to Tennessee to face formal charges. While in custody, Natasha granted an interview to newsstand tabloid The Weekly World News. Cornette boasted she was Satan's daughter. She said that she believed in ritual murder. Natasha always said afterward that she only gave that interview because that's what this lawyer told her to do, that somehow it was going to help her case to appear insane. Soon after the interview was published, Natasha changed lawyers. Cornette and her five co-defendants were each charged with three counts of first-degree murder and one count of attempted murder. Prosecutors hoped to seek the death penalty, but several defendants claimed that the sole shooter was their youngest accomplice, 14-year-old Jason Bryant. This presented a crucial problem. In Tennessee, juveniles cannot receive the death penalty. With the death penalty ruled out for one prime suspect, prosecutors changed their strategy. We dropped the request for a death penalty. We made them the offer that they could plead guilty to first-degree murder and go before the court to have the court determine whether or not they were to serve life without parole or life. In February 1998, all six defendants pled guilty. The following month, they appeared for a dramatic sentencing hearing. 
four of the accused addressed the court. Natasha testified she was no longer the leader after the group left Kentucky. Cornette even maintained she tried to stop the shooting of the Lillylid family. I failed in my attempt to, to stop the death of them. And uh, that weighed heavily on my conscience. The judge ruled Natasha was, quote, not necessarily a ringleader for the killings, but she was the instigator and the orchestrator of the trip and the things that led to the death of the Lily Lids. She was the leader of the group. She used whatever she had available to get them into the group and to keep them in the group. She received the maximum penalty, three life sentences without parole for the murders of Vidar, Delfina, and Tabitha Lillilid. The five other defendants received the same sentence. Plus, all six were given an additional 25 years for the attempted murder of the sole survivor, two-year-old Peter Lillilid. In a sense, a very real sense, they received a death penalty. They will not leave the penitentiary system until they're dead. For her part, Natasha Cornett maintains that better mental health care might have prevented her unthinkable actions. Taking life is never justifiable. Never. There's always options. There's always choices. And I should have made different choices, but hindsight is great, you know? Next, she was the new kid in town, on her own and looking for friends. Was Charlie Ely an innocent bystander or part of a sadistic plot to murder a 15-year-old neighbor? And then I heard gunshots. I was like, what the hell is going on? Most of her life, Charlie Ely was a good girl with very bad luck. My parents didn't take good care of me the way they should have, so they lost custody. From her earliest days, Charlie got used to feeling abandoned. By age 18, Ely was married to a 21-year-old with a record. Only four months after saying I do, Charlie's home life was again torn apart. He was arrested for violating his probation and left her basically alone. As she reveals in this exclusive interview, the lonely teenager quickly found a new family and a world of trouble that ended in murder. I was one of the kids who was like, as soon as I turn 18, I'm gonna leave. Look at what happened. Not even a year later, where am I sitting? Oh, childhood. At the beginning, it was like a little rough and then it got a little better. Around age six, Charlie and her younger sister were taken in by their aunt and uncle. Be honest, I think of my aunt Lisa, my mom. I think of my Uncle Mike, my dad. By all accounts, uh, her life in Maryland was uh, a typical teenager. Jessica Lukey was Charlie's best friend in high school. The two girls were in the Naval Junior Officer Training Corps together. She got along with everyone. She was very outgoing and just really relaxed. She didn't seem like she was the type of girl that would fall into the wrong crowd in high school. Never had any fights according to her family. She was bullied a bit by some of her classmates because she had an eye problem. She was legally blind in one eye, and they picked on her a little bit for that. Charlie looked forward to escaping her small Maryland town. An unexpected opportunity came up after Charlie graduated in the spring of 2010. I moved from Maryland to come down to Florida to try to reconnect with my mother. I didn't listen to my Aunt Lisa and all them when they said, be careful, Charlie, why don't you just wait a couple of years and see where it goes? Charlie had another reason for moving to northern Florida. She was already forming a relationship with the son of her mother's boyfriend, 21-year-old Joseph David Burham. I had a message from him, and I had just turned 18, so that made it even better. So I read his message, and I got his number, and I started texting him. It was July 13th when we first started texting, and we started dating that night. It went from there. It was great. Ely arrived in Lakeland, Florida in August 2010 with the promise of a new boyfriend and reuniting with her estranged mother. As her relatives in Maryland predicted, Charlie's reunion was short-lived. Well, I dove in. 
was at my mom's for two or three days. I ended up being like, you know, Joe, I need to get out of this. I can't do it. Despite the disappointment about her mother, Charlie's romance with Joe Burham heated up quickly. In early September, less than two months after Ely moved to Florida, she married Joe, even though he had a criminal record. His conviction for lewd and lascivious sexual battery restricted where the newlyweds could live. He was on probation. He couldn't leave the county. We found a place to live, and it was actually in Summerfield, Florida, which is still Ocala. The honeymoon didn't last long. In January of 2011, Burham violated the terms of his probation and was sentenced to serve three years in prison. I did feel pretty vulnerable. I'm 18. Husband just got arrested. What do I do now? I barely know anybody here. On her own in an unfamiliar town, Charlie found a way to make new friends. Charlie had a house. These other kids were able to get away from their parents and sort of hang out all together without any rules, really. They just did whatever they wanted to. Charlie's home became a hangout for a tight group of local kids, including 20-year-old Justin Soto and 19-year-old Michael Bargo. My husband had told me not to hang out with Michael Bargo or Justin Soto. I didn't listen to him. And I decided that I was going to have them live with me. Soon, Bargo's friends, 16-year-old Kyle Hooper and his 15-year-old sister, Amber Wright, were also regulars at Charlie's house. According to court testimony, Amber was in the middle of a stormy breakup with her 15-year-old boyfriend, Seth Jackson. Seth Jackson originally was, was dating Amber. Um, something transpired in their relationship where they separated, and then Seth was trying to come back into the picture with Amber. During this time, Charlie and Amber became close. Ely and Amber were best friends. That friendship would be marked by violence. And then I heard gunshots. I was like, what the hell is going on? Coming up, the grisly details of a terrible death. For such a brutal crime, it was almost professional. She's scared. Nineteen-year-old Charlie Ely's reunion with her estranged mother fizzled, and her husband was locked up on a parole violation. On her own, in a new town, Charlie invited a group of teens into her home. Ely's new best friend, 15-year-old Amber Wright, had just broken up with her boyfriend, 15-year-old Seth Jackson. All I knew was he was an ex of Amber's, period, end of story. According to police reports, on the night of April 17th, 2011, Charlie helped lure Seth to her house. Charlie had told us that when he arrived at the house that she actually opened the door for him. I was like, hey, what's up? What do you need? He's like, oh, I want to talk to Amber. I was like, OK, come on in. Seth had no idea what he was in for. I wish I could have done something, but I couldn't. According to court records, Seth tried to run out of the house. A neighbor reported seeing three male figures chase him and drag him back inside. Although the crime happened in her home, Charlie told police she had nothing to do with it. I was like, holy cow. I ran into my room. I didn't know what to do. I heard a few gunshots, door slamming. According to police reports, Seth was beaten and shot multiple times before he died. Then his body was set on fire. The day after the gruesome attack on Seth, his mother reported the 15-year-old missing. That night, police launched an investigation. On April 19th, two days after Seth disappeared, police brought Charlie and some of her friends in for questioning. You know a lot more than what you're telling me. I know a lot more than what you're telling me. Can we agree with that? Law enforcement has a good way to try to coax things out of you. Let's just put it that way. I didn't trick her in any way for her to tell me the truth. You knew that Seth was never going to walk out of your house alive. Is that correct? Yeah. After more than two hours of questioning, Charlie was exhausted. All by myself once again. The search led police to a remote lime rock pit where divers found three large paint buckets containing ashes and other remains. More burnt human remains were discovered in a fire pit at Charlie's home. There was very little physical evidence of what had actually occurred there. 
Forensic tests identified the victim as Seth Jackson. For such a brutal crime, it was almost professional, which is scary. Charlie, along with Michael Bargo, Justin Soto, Kyle Hooper, and Amber Wright were arrested and charged with first-degree murder. All five pleaded not guilty. Ely's defense attorney, Jonathan Bull, requested a speedy trial for his client. Mr. Bull was thinking that it would behoove her to, to just go ahead and, and get this done, maybe c catch the prosecution off guard a bit. Charlie's trial began in September 2011, six months after the murder. On September 23, 2011, the case went to the jury. It took a little more than an hour for jurors to reach a unanimous verdict. Charlie Ely was found guilty of first-degree murder. The only time that there was any real emotion was when the jury handed down the verdict, when she broke down and sobbed. A month later, Charlie was back in court to hear her sentence. It is the judgment of the law and the sentence of the court that you spend the remainder of your natural life confined in the Florida Department of Corrections. A life sentence is imposed. Ironically, while the 19-year-old will likely spend the rest of her days in prison, Charlie's husband, Joe Burrow, is scheduled to be released in September 2012. Charlie will have to live with regret. There's so many things that rushed through my head that I wish I could have done. I could have, should have, would have done. But I didn't. Amber Wright, Kyle Hooper, Michael Bargo, and Justin Soto maintain their innocence. They are currently awaiting trial for first-degree murder. Advice that I'd give other young women, listen to the people who love you. I had talked to my aunt a few times, and she wanted me to come up and live with her and come back up to Maryland. I never did that. I wish I would have, because I want to go home. I really want to go home. Next, a story so strange it has to be true. The girl who said yes to her mother's murder and lived with the body for almost a month. Tess Dam was truly the mastermind and the driving force behind this. On a cold winter night in February 2007, Police in Lafayette, Colorado answered an anonymous call. Officers received the tip that Linda Dam had been murdered. At the home of 52-year-old Linda Dam, police say they found her 15-year-old daughter Tess and Tess's boyfriend, 17-year-old Brian Grove. As more officers arrived, they began to try and develop more information about Linda Dam. Was she safe? Was she still alive? The bizarre answer would generate shocking national headlines. As a child, Tess Dam faced major challenges. Tess Dam grew up without a father. Her father and mother split when she was two. Linda was very clearly addicted to alcohol, very severely alcoholic. But by all accounts, Tess and her mother enjoyed a close relationship. In 2004, when Tess was 13, she joined a basketball team at the local rec center. Eddie Anderson was the coach. She really loved her mom. Even in practice, she would go hug her mom. But Linda would come up to me, and I could smell alcohol on her breath. By 2006, things were changing. According to the Rocky Mountain News, on several occasions, Tess was picked up by police for violating curfew. In July, she was escorted home by a cop who was alarmed by Linda Dam's condition. An officer sees Linda stumbling down the stairs. She's visibly intoxicated. Lafayette police say they did try to get social services to intervene. They faxed over the request to the county social services, and apparently the fax never arrived. A few months later, Tess met Brian Grove at an area youth center. According to the Denver Post, by early 2007, Brian was living with Tess in Linda's home. But the young couple wanted a house of their own. They found a model home worth approximately a half million dollars, and they told their friends they wanted to kill Linda Dom to get the money to buy this house. A 16-year-old friend named Jared Smith described a conversation with Tess and Brian that started at a local restaurant near the end of February 2007. Smith told police Tess and Brian talked about how much they hated Linda. On the drive back to Linda's home, 
Brian allegedly asked Tess if she wanted him to take care of her mother. Tess said yes. Brian went in the home while Tess and Jared were driving around. Jared Smith said he had no idea what Brian had planned. Brian later admitted that he had tried to strangle Linda and that didn't work. When she lost consciousness, he got a knife, drove it into her neck, and so hard that he actually couldn't pull the knife back out again. Got another knife and ended up stabbing her uh, more times until, until she died. He stabbed her approximately 18 times. According to Jared Smith, Brian called and asked him to come to the house. When Jared arrived, Brian told him that he killed Linda. Jared said he did not want to be involved. Brian told him that he was already involved. Smith claimed he closed his eyes while he helped Brian move Linda's body. They had taken Linda, wrapped her up in a knife, and they put her into the Subaru. Brian then turned to his best friend, 18-year-old Jared Guy, for help. Brian and Guy were both born in India and raised by Colorado families. We considered each other brothers. In his interview with police, Guy offered a different version of Linda Dam's death. He said Brian Grove told him Linda attacked Tess. Grove simply came to her aid. They said it was more of a self-defense kind of thing, that Brian went in and tried to protect Tess. Jared Guy claims he advised Brian to turn himself into police. But after much convincing, Guy agreed to help his friend dispose of Linda's body. Guy told the cops they considered leaving the corpse in a landfill. Instead, they ended up at a local cemetery. The ground was frozen. Brian thought that they hadn't buried her deep enough, so he brought Jared Guy, and they both dug her back up and then drove back to the house. According to police records, Linda's body remained in the car parked in the garage. After the entire incident happened, you know, I was just in shock, and I really just wanted to go back to the happy little life that I'd created for my own self. Brian and Tess lived in the home and played house. She would send him things saying, you know, your wifey did the laundry for you. They bought groceries, they cooked. The young couple also acted like rebellious teenagers. They were having parties at the house, car surfing out in the street, and really up to some, some pretty wild behavior. But the parties ended with the anonymous call to police on the night of February 27, 2007. Prosecutors believe the tip came from one of Tess's friends. When the police showed up to the house, they were able to find uh, the body on, in fairly short order. Tess Dam, Brian Grove, and Jared Smith were taken into custody that night. Jared Guy was arrested later that week. Jared Smith was charged with being an accessory to the crime and pleaded guilty. He was sentenced to serve two years in juvenile detention. Jared Guy was charged with being an accessory to the crime and to tampering with evidence. He pleaded not guilty to both charges. Several months later, Guy agreed to a deal and pleaded guilty to the tampering charge. He was sentenced to six months of work release, followed by six months of home detention, then three years of probation. If I could go back to, to them and change my actions, I would have still tried to help him, but I would have tried to help him in the sense of, like, make him call the cops. Ultimately, Brian Grove and Tess Dam were each charged with first-degree murder for the death of Linda Dam. Brian copped a plea to second-degree murder. He was sentenced to 40 years in prison. Tess also pleaded guilty to second-degree murder and solicitation of murder. She was ordered to serve 23 years behind bars. Tess Dam will be released before she turns 40 years old. Brian Grove was a hands-on killer, but Tess Dam was truly the mastermind and the driving force behind this. She's the one that told Brian Grove to kill her mother. These teens could have been the girls next door anywhere in America until fateful decisions turned lives of promise into lives marked by violence and tragedy.